Professor Yeping Wu of the Catholic University of America in the US, who is also the Executive Director, Council for Research in Values and Philosophy. Your Grace, Archbishop Thomas, Menam Peram Phil, from North Eastern India, Diocese of Wazong. Professor and Mrs. Onyang Khan, University of Science and Technology, China. Professor Dan Chitu. I always apologize because I can't say these names right. Who's that? University of IAC in Romania. I hope I got this one right this time. Reverend Dr. Peter Zhao. Vicar General of Beijing Diocese, Reverend Father Eusebio, SBD, Society of Divine World, right here now in Kenya, Dr. Radoslav Malinowski of Tangaza, Tangaza University College, Sister Caroline Nkobelani from St. Augustine University in Tanzania. Dr. Jane Wazuta of Strathmore University. All other guests and participants in this conference, good morning and welcome. On behalf of uh, the Catholic University of Eastern Africa, and on my own behalf, I sincerely welcome you all, participants of the Council of Research in Values and Philosophy International Conference that is being held at this university for the first time. Ever since the 70s, the Council for Research in Values and Philosophy has coordinated and organized international conferences at universities in different countries. In big countries such as China and India, these conferences are held in a number of universities. I understand that with the hosting of this conference at the Catholic University of Eastern Africa this weekend, we are making history as Kenya becomes the very first country in Africa to host these conferences at more than one venue. Kwea now joins the University of Nairobi in hosting these annual conferences. Queer's pleasure and appreciation of this inclusion have been expressed in, by combining the graduation ceremonies which only ended yesterday with the conference. At the graduation mass on Thursday, some of the concelebrants were conference participants who had traveled all the way from such far places as the USA, Romania, China again. From our own continent, we have participants from, they are expecting to be here, from North Africa, West Africa, South Africa, and East Africa. From Kenya, we are happy to be with participants from our universities, such as Tangaza, Strathmore, Kenyatta University, among others. Of course, our own queer participants students and uh, participants will be uh, taking part in these two days. All of you are most welcome. Please feel at home at the Catholic University of Eastern Africa. In a special way, I would like to welcome Professor Yu Yenpeng, the Council of Research in Values and Philosophy, Executive Director from the Catholic University of, East of America. In regards to this conference, I first heard about Professor Yu Yipeng last year in August. 
I sincerely thank her for accepting to include queer into the CRVP international conferences, thus putting our young university on the international limelight. I also thank her for the commitment to publish the conference proceedings and other articles of an African theme. Professor Yue Peng, please accept my further thanks and gratitude for allowing queer to participate in the August September workshops. At this juncture, I also like to express my very sincere thanks to our very own Professor Ernest Bieraza, who success, successfully made all these negotiations and who is the CRVP representative, the contact person at Queer. His efforts to make the current conference a success speak for themselves. Let me say something about now the relevance of what I think is the relevance of CRVP to Africa. If we're going to talk about values, I think the very first question that we must ask in Africa is whose values? Whose values are we talking about? And I was extremely glad to note that CRVP does not come to impose any set of values on anyone. I understand that CRVP aims at the understanding and appreciations of one's own culture and the values that motivate and shape aspirations and motivate action. For me, this is a big plus. And being in Africa, there is a very good reason why we must ask the question, whose values are we trying to promote? Our history is full of instances where the African people have had decisions, serious decisions, commitment made for them and on their behalf, but without their involvement. If you look, and we are very grateful for what the missionaries did, but if you look back, you know that what they did was they came in and wiped away the values that we had so that they could implant their own values or what they thought were values in its place. The same thing happened when the colonialists came. They had very little respect for our values. Instead, they wanted to wipe away the slate so that they could write these values for us. That has continued. Uh, you may say even slave trade itself actually was a statement. But you can look at uh, neo-colonialism, what has happened since independence and after independence. And you can also look now at what we are calling economic aid or aid to developing countries. What really happens there? Because we are poor, we accept the aid. We accept the help. We need help. But it is clear that this help is never just help. It is help with strings attached. And if we are very critical, if we look at this aid very carefully, we will see that it is a promotion, a way to promote the values of the donor. It's very clear to us. But because we are desperate, because we are poor, because we need help, we take it. And we leave other people's values, not our own. So I think in Africa, the question of whose values are you promoting then becomes really important and critical. That going forward, Africans must take 
central place in determining and deciding what is important for them, what is valuable to them, and therefore what values they will live as a society and as individuals. So I really want to congratulate CRVP because I think they have taken the right approach, which is to take you where you are with your own values and help you to understand those and to see how better to enhance those values that you already have decided are your values, your culture. So I, I, I really am very happy about that. As we talk about values, I think it will be important and actually what could be more critical and more important to our nations and our continent at this time than really re-examine those values that we live, by which we live. I think this is very timely. This conference for us is very timely. And for this particular country in Kenya, seeing what we are going through right now in terms of moral decline, in terms of values that are really a challenge for this country, I think that someone really needs to be thinking and influencing what is happening. And we are just the right people to do that. Because if we leave it to politicians, it will never happen. If we leave it to other people who have other interests, it won't happen. But scholars who are genuine and have no vested interests can really help societies to move ahead. <clears throat> but for that, we do require some critical thinking. We really have to look at the issues critically. We have to understand these values and re-examine them and, and uh, not just take them on face values. I think if we do this, our self-appreciation will be, obviously, it will give us confidence in what we are doing. We will appreciate ourselves better. And I think this is the value of this conference, that it is giving us the opportunity to do just that, to really examine critically our own values. Um, as individuals and as society. If we talk about values, I think we must talk about education. Because how else do you share values? I know um, one philosopher of uh, education who defined education as initiation. That education is Initiation is a kind of initiation into the values and the attitudes and whatever society thinks is important. So this is how we initiate our young people into and share with them the values that we hold dear. And because of that, therefore, I think we really must think very seriously how education, formal and informal, you know, can help us enhance and develop and, and share, you know, our values. And I think for me, I am very convinced that when it comes to talking about values, the journey is very long. It's a very long journey. Because it is a journey that begins from the head. First, you've got to understand. We begin here. So we have to know, we have to understand what we are talking about. These values. These values are not just meant as theoretical, you know, knowledge that we have, but that they really help us to shape ourselves, our lives. And that already is a long journey. Coming from the head, getting to the heart is not short, and it requires a lot of effort. But it's not the end of the journey. Having come from the head and come to the heart, it cannot just rest there in the heart. It must now travel to the hands because we need to do, we need to now put those values into practice. We need to use them. We want to live by those values. So dear participants, this is what this is about. That when we talk about values, 
uh, and, and uh, we are not just like philosophers or you know okay one thing that philosophers are blamed for is that they debate and talk about anything provided they talk that philosophers and, and this is not my view I'm just telling you what people say out there that philosophers think that when you sit down and talk philosophically to yourselves and discuss all these things and you feel very warm and nice you can now walk out and go away because you have achieved the purpose of philosophy we personally I don't want to be associated with that kind of philosophy because I don't think the purpose of knowledge is or I don't believe in knowledge for its own sake I believe that knowledge must find its place its relevance in people's lives and if it doesn't get to that level it is not useful that's why why I also think that the most important uh, branch of philosophy with the due respect I know there are metaphysicians here and I know there are people in epistemology and other things but I think the most important of them all is really the practical side of ethics character Models. So in this conference, we will be expected not only to talk, but also to really pay attention, you know, to what does that translate into. So how do we move from the head to the heart and to the hands to into practice? It is also very interesting that we in Africa can talk about. Um, these values and particularly in connection to something I have seen the theme the general theme of CRVP is the question of re um, they, they were trying to see how how can we relieve our values what are the ways of doing that I think that's the general theme of, of, of the conference and I think that in this area we in Africa can also make a contribution. I know people think and they know that Africa is uh, one of the poorest uh, continents in the world. That is not true, even materially. But anyway, we are treated as if we are the poorest and who cannot make any contribution, have not made any contribution, rather than the raw materials that we produce for the rest of the world to process and of course bring back to us. I want to say that is not is probably not the most important contribution that Africa has made or can make. In my opinion, Africa has a great contribution to make, even globally. And that contribution is that we can remind the rest of the world that life is worth living that there is another way to live life that the most important things in life are not just, just about acquisition about fame about but that relationships with other people is important very important and that life is really about that much more than everything else that we have glorified. I know those societies used to believe the same things a long time ago, but they have now forgotten what it really means to live a life. And I think Africa can make a contribution, a substantial contribution in that direction. I have to say that uh, in almost every conference I have attended that touches Africa, one notices that Africans have continued, they have continued to blame the outside world for our plight, for where we find ourselves. And it is very easy to find fault. It is very easy to point at others and say, we in Africa are suffering because you did that. And of course our history, like I said, is really about that. 
they took us as slaves. Not that we were completely innocent ourselves, because we even turned against each other and started selling each other to slave owners. We played a part in that. But we can point and say, you, you are responsible for where we are today because of the slave trade. They came and colonized us and wiped away our values, our systems, so that they could, you know, impose theirs. We can continue to point at them and say, you destroyed our destiny, you misled us, we were going in a certain path, and, but you completely disoriented us. They then came and gave us an education system which was meant to serve only them, not us and completely disorganized us in the process, disregarding our own, of course. They said we had no education before that. We know better than that. Even after we became independent, they still continued influencing our decisions and our operations to their advantage. And today, as I've just said, they continue with their aid packages, you know, aid packages, to influence and to, to make sure that we promote their values, along with a few of our own. So it is very easy for Africans to point out and say, yeah, you see, these are the people who are responsible, these are the people who have put us where we are. But you know, we've been independent 50 years now. Most countries have been 50 years of independence. And I think really we have absolutely no reason, no further excuse to point at anyone and say that they are responsible for the destiny of Africa. I think we have to accept this responsibility and completely understand that what happens to us now is in our hands. The fact that we are a corrupt nation is not because we were slaves once. If we continue killing each other for whatever reason we are doing that, it is not because we were once colonized. If our moral, our morals in society are declining and decaying, it is not because we are receiving aid. So we really as Africans, I address the Africans now yeah, in participating in this Congress, we really have to shape up and take responsibility for our own lives and the lives of our people. And we as scholars certainly have a responsibility to try and influence the way that things are done. And that's why therefore I think this conference is extremely important if you ask me. It really is giving us a wonderful opportunity to reflect on some of these things and to say what are we really doing as scholars, as people who understand these things. What is our role in society? What else can we do that we are not doing? That also is the only way we move away from what they call those ivory towers in the universities and get down to the society, link up the society, lead them, help them. So we need to look for ways of influencing decision makers, policy makers, people who call the shots. But unfortunately, a lot of times, our voices are not to be heard by anybody. And when we do publish, we are only interested in counting one more publication for promotion. So this is the Council for Research. Research. So the emphasis obviously is going to be on research. And I'm, I'm happy to see that. Because, to be very truthful, and I talk now only for this country, most of our universities talk about three pillars. The three pillars of the university. And we talk about the academic, which normally means teaching. We talk about research. And we talk about community service. 
But you know, with only a few exceptions, if you look at our institutions, really the thing we are really doing, whether out of necessity or ne negligence, is teaching. That's all we do. Most of our emphasis in most of our universities is on teaching. Teaching and learning. Which is a good thing, of course. To the others, perhaps community service and research, we pay a lot of lip service. And of course we do that kind of research which must be done because, you know, then people have to get more degrees, they have to get certificates and things like that. But what kind of research are we doing? And how does that research really, away from the technical, you know, side, how does it help to translate into, you know, standards, better standards of living for our people? And how often are we really keeping that in mind as opposed to, I need this research or this project done and assessed so that I can get a degree or get a diploma. I need to get out of here. So, what this council is doing then, and I have looked and seen quite a number of publications they've done already in the past, is to motivate us and to challenge us to get out there and carry out, you know, that kind of important research that's really going to be meaningful and transformative, you know, in people's lives. Of course, in line with values. And I think we need to accept that challenge that this conference is bringing us. And really begin to address it for our own good and the good of our people. So I am happy that we are being given this challenge and this opportunity to reflect and to think and perhaps to find a way forward on how we can be more relevant and more useful to our communities, to our societies. Therefore, in this research I expect that we will be addressing some fundamental issues such as, for example, how do you change people's attitudes? Because attitudes is about values. So how do we change people's attitudes? And as I mentioned that, I, and I've talked, told people this before, we don't even have to go outside our continent to see that in some parts of this continent, people have the right attitudes. I remember one time, about two years ago, I went to Ghana, Accra in Ghana, to a conference. And on a Sunday, I went to service, to Mass. And I kind of expected that what I see here, what we do here, is very much the same with what happens there. So I noted people came with very expensive items to chat. Some people on tablets, some people on cameras, some people on, you know, their handbags, and you could see, you know, and these are valuable things. They came with them. And they simply laid them on the pews, you know. And when it was time to go for communion, you know, to, you have to go to the altar, you know, to receive communion. Ordinarily, in Kenya, what happens is, when it is time to go, you grab your property. And you walk with it, for fear that it will, it will be stolen. So you go to communion, you come back and, you know, your handbag, you can't turn to it to make sure. So when it was time to go, I saw everybody left their things where they were. There was no question of watch this while I'm gone. Everybody just went. And they came back and found their things there. So I was so impressed with this that at the end, when it was over, I called someone and said, how is it possible that you people can... You know, all these things can be left behind there and nobody touches it. And the man told me, oh, this is Ghana. We do not steal. And I said, really? But Ghana is in Africa, you know that. I hope you know, Ghana is in Africa. So it's an African country. So they have the right attitude to life. They don't steal. They respect people's properties. Now come back to Kenya. So, what is the difference? And can we 
get involved in some kind of research to find out how do you influence those kind of attitudes. For me, this would be very important because it's not just a question of identifying values, it's also a question of saying, so what do we do with these values? How can we help people you know, to change you know, the way they look at things? So this is what I would expect if we are really doing research in values. The question also is, can we really teach values the same way that we teach knowledge and skills? I would expect someone to really go into that and say, well, perhaps when it comes to values, we need to do these things slightly differently. And the reason I say this is that I want to give again the example of Kenya. We, for 50 years, actually 50, we, Kenya became independent in 1963. So if you work it out, that is... Uh, uh, 54 years now, 50, yeah, about 54 years, we have been educating. And the first national goal of education in Kenya is to create national unity. That is the first goal of education in this country. So for 54 years, we have been trying to achieve the goal of national unity. If you ask, I know there are some Kenyans in here today. If you ask the Kenyans around you, are we now more united as a nation 54 years later than we were 54 years ago, you are almost sure to get the answer, no. So for me it is very important to know why has 54 years of education not achieved the first goal of education. And that is a value. And this is actually the first value of this country, national unity. So why have we failed? I am afraid if you look deeper, you may find that Part of the reason that we have failed is we try to teach that goal the same way that we teach mathematics, the same way that we teach literature, how we teach geography. In other words, we took an academic approach to achieving this goal. And I think this is probably one, one of the reasons why we have not succeeded. So I would like to see research that goes in to find out what are the components that are different about values? The emotional components, you know, that are the affective domain that, you know, touches on values which may not necessarily be the case with skills and knowledge. I think that's important for us to find out. And I'm hoping when we start going into these things, these are the kind of things that we will be looking at. I would expect that when we talk about values, we are also thinking about the relationship between the individual and the society. So, how, what is my standing in society? And how does that affect how I behave? How does that affect the society? The lawyer talked about rights, but in the area of values, are they personal values and are they common values? Am I entitled as an individual to certain values even if the society may not approve them? So what is the role? Once again, we may want to do research and find out. What exactly? We talk about common good, the common good. And I have to tell you, one day I stood here and I was talking about common good. This hall was full because we were thinking, we were, actually that was the theme uh, on justice and common theme. And after presenting, making a presentation, one of the students, I think he was in that corner over there, put up his hand and said, yes, this is all very good. It's very nice to talk about common good, you know. 
But why am I obligated as an individual to respect the common good? So perhaps we can throw some light on this. You know, the relationships. Why is it important? It's not just about me. And this is where we perhaps also need to do some comparative studies. We know now that, uh, of course, Africans are very good at aping everything that we see. We know, and someone talked about our own tradition of values, which were very important, and Ubuntu, and all these things, which are wonderful. But we left those so that we can become like everybody else. And in the process, we have lost the most important area of values, which is how we relate with each other. That used to be the way that you are judged. How do you fit in society? What is your integrity? That's the issue, integrity, as far as dealing with others and in society goes. That we forgot because we saw others who are going the way of individualism. And so we aped them. And now we have become even more individualistic than they are. So these are all things that I think a conference like this really should begin to explore. The influences by other societies and by other, you know, um, um, groups. When it comes to philosophy, because um, I think the P on CRVP is philosophy, even though we're talking about cultures and things like that, clearly we need to know how do these values, the, the values that we hold, how do they inform our thinking and our general outlook to life? Well, so why are they so important? I mean, there's something they call the world view, how I see the world. You know, you must be standing somewhere to be able to see the world. But what is it that informs, you know, um, that outlook that you have? So what is the importance of these values? And what about things like mindset? Mindset. I'm told in South Korea, you know, they have this and I think Singapore, this, you know, some of these countries, uh, at a certain point they had to change the way that the nation and the people think about themselves and the rest of the world. Mindset. And someone has told me the mindset of Kenyans is money. At the moment the mindset is money. Money, more money, and more money. So as long as you can make money, more money and more money, you are okay. That is why our heroes are those people who have stolen the most amount of money. We, these are the people that we are presenting to our children and saying these are the people who admire. Right now as we go to general elections, some of these big thieves that everyone knows, they have stolen, you know, they have ruined the coffers of the nation. Those are the ones we are putting back in place and rewarding them. So obviously our mentality is money, 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 money. The question for you is how do we change mindset? How do we change that mindset and probably direct it on relationships? That it is important to relate well with others. It is important to be honest. It is important to even have little but have a good name, you know. So this is what we will be looking for from philosophy and from this council, if they can help us get some of these things right. Finally, the theme of this conference, very interesting, the clash in values. Between more, so what, at, and uh, the DVC, uh, Professor Kako already started by asking us, uh, obviously, we are thinking probably about modern and, you know, traditional values. So we need to look at that and say, so uh, this clash, of course we know historically with some of those we know and, 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 and so on, but we need to look deeper and say, are they, in fact, some of what we call values, are they really values or are they pseudo values? Is it possible that we are actually deceiving ourselves? with some of the things that we may not even be very clear about values. And if we are not very clear about both traditional and modern, then we can't compare them because maybe they are not even values in the first place. So we could be misleading ourselves. So I think we need to be very careful when we talk about this. 
And uh, I just want to say, for a long time in this country, we did not have a common set of values. Actually, it was only with the promulgation of the new constitution, which um, was in 20, 20, 2010, yes. That's the first time that there was an attempt to bring uh, something of a semblance of national values. And they ended up with about 17 of those. And they said, this set of 17 values is what we shall call the national values. So everybody must subscribe to this. I am not sure, but um, if you look at some of them, there could be even conflict, you know, between some of the values that we are trying to promote on the one hand with some others. So the question is also, how do our values relate one to the other, you know? Supposing there is a conflict, which one goes where? What do we do? In other words, is there such a thing as a hierarchy of values? And what would that consist of? I think it's important we talk about those kind of things. You know, because we may be promoting a lower value at the expense of a higher value. Unless we understand and we agree that this is important. So that at the expense of uh, saving, you know, um, telling the truth, we may destroy a life. So which is more important, to destroy a life so that we can tell the truth or to tell a lie so that we can save a life? So this hierarchy of values, I think, is important. Let's see whether, in fact, there is such a thing and, therefore, how is that determined and how is it, or how can we enforce it? So then we are going to be, I would expect, in this uh, conference, there will be uh, presentations touching on traditional modern values. I would expect that there will be um, conflict and clashes in values held by adults and those held by teenagers and so on and so forth. I would expect that there will be issues of religious values conflicting, um, matters of personal and public values, um, the common good as I mentioned earlier, and um, how other cultures have survived. Yes, we are now talking about African culture. Yes, I, I'm just about there, honest. Um, we are talking about African values. But are there other countries, developing countries, or even developed countries, that have done better than we are doing? How did they get there? And I'm just thinking off my head. China, it seems that uh, they, they have done very well in preserving their values. Even though now they are a very modern state, a very modern country, so can we learn lessons from others who are struggling with these issues so that we don't always have to fall in the ditch uh, where somebody else has, has been before? Um, so in conclusion, I really would like to say that for me, from where I stand, I see that this council, the council for research and in values and cultures and philosophy is really a wonderful opportunity that has come to us. An opportunity that, is, that we are being given for us to, as Africans to control our destiny, to have a say in where we will go, in what is important for us, in what we will promote. And you know, participants, dear guests, participants. I say this because right now there is a lot of interest in Africa. A lot of interest. There is a new interest. There is a new wave of interest in this continent. For a while they called us the dark continent. Nobody wanted to come here. Everything that we read about Africa was always negative. You know, there was never anything good about it. But if you have been observing, things are picking up. And now Africa is being considered, you know, instead of, today as we talk, the president of this country is in Italy. I think that's where they have the G7, you know. And so they are also giving audience to Africans. I understand there will be four, four of them, you know, uh, where they just made decisions like they are done in Berlin. They took them up and just cut it and decided, oh, okay, this, you, Germany, take that, France, take this, and so on. We were not concerned about that. 
So with this new interest, I think it is important for Africans to insist, what is it you really want from us? And how are we involved in making those decisions? You know, because now we are independent, so we must also be concerned. I think it's really important, but then for us, we have to know what is it we want, you know, even. So it means then we have to define our values very clearly. So this is why I think that we in Africa have really got to play a more um, aggressive and a more active role, you know, so that we can uh, put those values that we believe in, we can uh, make them, you know, before decisions are made. And so, as institutions of higher learning, because now I'm concluding, we hope that the research that we're going to be involved in in values will not be just another one that we make publications and put on these shelves. So I think the next most important thing for us now is also to lobby decision makers who need to know what we have found out about values and help them to use that knowledge for the good of the country and really make sure that the important findings of our research are taken into consideration in making those very important decisions for the country and for the continent. Let me again welcome you to the Catholic University of Eastern Africa and let me wish you <clears throat> two days of very, very fruitful. Uh, so someone might be looking around and saying, but we are so few. I think that would be the wrong consideration. First of all, I want to explain that the university the university. Of course, the university population won't be here. But with the end of graduation yesterday, when a graduation ends, and you have only one weekend in between, and then you have to jump into another semester, that is the weekend that people really just want to relax. So somehow from the point of planning, that can explain why we are not this many. But it is not the numbers. And I think we know that. It is not the numbers that matter. It is the quality of what comes out and what we do in that. And I believe that we are up to it. Let me wish you very happy deliberations. And uh, once again, I'm extremely grateful that this opportunity is given to us. And so um, I heard Ernest say that I therefore should declare the conference open. And so I'm happy to do that. God bless you.